As always, thank you, Patrice. U.S. Marshals is one of my all-time favorite Wesley Snipes movies. It has such a great cast. For those of you who have not seen it, there's Tommy Lee Jones, Robert Downey Jr.'s The Bad Guy. I mean, it's a perfect, and it's a sequel to the movie The Fugitive. And I enjoy the movie so much, and I enjoy Wesley Snipes' character in the movie so much that it's brought me to a place where I can forgive him for making Demolition Man and Blade 12. And so Snipes in the movie um, U.S. Marshals, he plays a character named Sheridan, and Sheridan is on the run from the authorities. You see, it's a little bit, I, I recognize, it's a little bit predictable in places because, you know, covert operative that's been framed being hunted by the bad FBI, CIA guys. But as a fugitive, he's also being hunted by Tommy Lee Jones and the U.S. Marshals. And if you, if just in the first five minutes of the movie, it seems like Wesley Snipes is doing everything you should do to evade people who are looking to have you arrested. Yeah. I mean, he moves to a different city. He changes his name. He gets a girlfriend. He gets an unlikely job, you know, or at least seems unlikely for a covert operative. He's driving a tow truck you know, around the city. He's keeping his head down. He's not drawing attention to himself. It's like he's in his own witness protection program. And then one day he's driving home from work, a careless driver turns in front of him and Snipes winds up crashing his truck to keep from hurting anybody else. Cause you know, his tow truck is so big and he gets knocked unconscious. And by the time he comes to the police are there, they found a revolver underneath the front seat of his truck. One thing led, leads to another and he gets arrested and they discover who he really is. And that all happens in like the first seven minutes of the movie. I'm telling you, it is action packed. Now, I don't know if that sounds like your kind of movie or not, but like I said, I, I enjoy it and I enjoy Snipes in it. And I also find it quite beneficial. The movie is almost a how-to in evading capture when you're a fugitive. So like, for instance, in those just first few minutes, you pick up on the fact that one, first thing you do if you're a fugitive is you should move to a big city where nobody knows you, right? Second, you should change who you are and what you do. Third, you probably should forget about your past life. And fourth, you keep your head down and you don't draw attention to yourself. And all of those kinds of things, when you say them, they make sense, right? I mean, if you want to evade being arrested and you're being hunted, then those are the kinds of things it makes sense that you would do so that you don't get arrested. Now, look with me at Acts chapter eight. Uh, let's start with some of the ground we covered last week, just for those of you who weren't with us in Acts chapter eight. Philip's colleague and brother in the faith, Stephen has been killed. He's martyred in a fairly gruesome way. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we pretty much pick up the action right after he's declared dead, right? So you guys with me, Acts chapter 8, verse 1? Yeah. Anybody? Anybody? Thumbs up? Good. Okay, cool. And Saul approved of their killing him. That's the very first part of Acts chapter 1. And in fact, you know what, let's just do a bit of color commentary as we go, shall we? For, for those of you who are not overly familiar with the Bible, Saul is a rising star in the Jewish firmament. He's destined for greatness as far as the Jewish ruling class is concerned, and he is zealous for the faith. So much so that I got to tell you, I think he played a role in engineering Stephen's death. And I'm not the only one. There's some really smart people who seem to agree with me that it seems that Paul was, or Saul, as he was called then, 
was kind of a shadow figure and he helped move behind the scenes to engineer what looked like a mob rising up to kill Stephen. Okay, back to the Bible, back to verse one. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. All right, this is, again, something we talked about last week. A great persecution broke out. And it seems like it was primarily aimed at the Hellenists, the, the Greek-speaking Jews who'd come from other countries and who found their way back to Jerusalem. Now, that doesn't mean that the apostles, those who are original ones who first followed Jesus uh, and are now leaders of the church, it doesn't mean that they didn't experience hardship. It just means that for whatever reason, they didn't have to escape Jerusalem to keep their lives. So the other thing I want you to note is that this persecution that's taking place so that you can kind of get your head around it, it looks a lot like something that seven or to the Christians in Vietnam during the reign of the Khmer Rouge. I mean, we're talking, this is really bad stuff. The authorities under Saul, they go from house to house throughout this big city of Jerusalem. And if they find a follower of Jesus there, whether male or female, doesn't matter. They drag them off to prison. That's what the scripture said they drag them off to prison. And the implication, implication being so that they can be punished. Now, Dr. Justo Gonzalez and Dr. Willie James Jennings both suggest in their commentaries that these folks who are hauled off in this persecution, they're hauled off so that they can either one, receive 39 lashes with the whip, or for some of them, like Stephen, they can be stoned to death. I mean, it's hard for us to even imagine. You and I, I mean, those of us here together, we've never experienced anything even close to that, right? Renounce your faith or you go to jail. No one's ever said that to you, right? Give up this foolishness about Jesus or be whipped within an inch of your life. You've never heard those words directed at you, right? You've never heard somebody say, you know what, your father and your mother, they're a pillar of the faith in your family. Stand here and watch while we beat them to death by throwing stones at them. Like I said, it's hard to imagine, right? It's hard to imagine because our, our faith has cost us so very little. But back to verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Now, I want you to bear in mind what we've just thought about that's gone down in Jerusalem. And I want you to read that verse again, okay? Those who had been scattered, those who had been run out of town, preached the word wherever they went. You know what the problem with verse 4 is? It's stuck between verses 3 and verse 5. You see, verse 3 seems like a really important verse. And verse 5 is going to seem like a really important verse. And so what happens is you get a really important verse and another one, and you think that something short and small like verse 3, you know, it's just kind of a transitional sentence. It's kind of a, a throwaway sentence. It's helped, helped you to, to pause and catch your breath before you move on to the action, right? But the problem is, is that verse four is significant. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You know what it's like? It's almost like Dr. Luke is saying, listen, you're going to read this next session, section, and you're going to be rightly impressed, and you're going to think that Philip is exceptional. And I want you to know that Philip is impressive, but he's not exceptional. 
What you're about to read happened everywhere. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. It's like Luke is saying, I'm just going to give you an example. Here, let me pick somebody, anybody. How about Philip? Okay, let me tell you about Philip because those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And that gives us the right context for verse 5. Verse 5 reads, Philip went down to a city in Samaria, and he proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so that there was great joy in that city. Now, press the pause button for just a second. Now, not all of us are familiar with the Bible. And so we might not know that the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans is not great. You see, the Jews, they lived specifically in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas of Judea, but north of Jerusalem and south of Galilee is this section referred to as Samaria. Now, it still counts as part of Judea, but the people who live there, they are not at all on good terms with the people who were considered Jews. See what happened, I'm just going to give you a real brief version of this, okay? The problem started a long, long time before Jesus was born, like almost 900 years before Jesus was born. You see, there were 12 tribes that made up the nation of Israel, and then there was a civil war. And when the civil war was over, 10 of those tribes, they became the nation of Israel. Their capital was in Samaria. The two other tribes of Israel, Judah and Benjamin, they became their own nation called Judah, and their capital was in Jerusalem. So in 722 BC, Samaria falls and Israel ceases to exist, right? Then in 599 BC, Jerusalem comes under siege uh, by the Babylonians, by the Babylonian star general, a guy by the name of Nebuzardan. And between the years 599 BC and 583 BC, Nebuzardan and the Babylonians destroy, I mean, just level Jerusalem, burn the gates, tear down the walls, flatten the temple. And what they do is they cart off, starting with the best and the best educated and the leaders and stuff, they cart off droves of people from Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. They take them to Babylon in exile, right? In fact, it's while these uh, children of Israel are in Babylon that they get the name Jews, right? They begin to be referred to as Jews. But then in 539 BC, a fellow by the name of Cyrus, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great of Persia, he conquers Babylon. And as soon as he conquers Babylon, I mean, part of the reason he was called Cyrus the Great is because he turned out to be a pretty good guy. One year later, 538 BC, Cyrus gives Ezra permission to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Later on, Artaxerxes is going to give Nehemiah permission to return to rebuild the walls and the gates and the like, right? And so all of the people with Ezra, the first group of people, they arrive back in Jerusalem, and there are people that had been left there for two generations, because not everybody was taken into exile, right? And so some of just the basic common laborers and, and those sorts of folks, they were left where Jerusalem used to be. And they've kind of been hanging out and they've intermarried with some Assyrians and they found some non-Jewish leadership and those sorts of things. And so when the Jews who have been in exile come back, they are so excited that they ask to join in the rebuilding of the temple. And Ezra and then later Nehemiah say, no way. 
uh uh-uh, you got no part in this, no. And they're shunned and they're considered enemies because they intermarried, because they were no longer of pure blood. Um, A host of things went into it. And evidently these folks who had been living there in the area, they didn't take rejection very well. And so they tried to stop the building of the temple, the building of the walls, the gates, the whole bit. They became the enemies of the Jews. So by the time we get to the first century when Jesus was alive, the lines are pretty well drawn. The Samaritans who live between Jerusalem and Galilee, well, Samaria was in Judea. And as far as outsiders were concerned, they were Jews. But to those of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas of Judea, they were half-breeds. They were wannabes. They were 'er ne'er-do-wells. They were gutter trash. They were treacherous people who didn't even floss. I mean, they were bad guys, right? Which is why when um, the account from John chapter four that PK read for us earlier of the woman at the well and talking with Jesus is so interesting is because Jews and Samaritans did not speak to each other, let alone associate with each other. That's why it's so appalling when the Samaritans are mostly shown in a good light in the book of Luke. I mean, Jesus, he tells it, it's terrible or this parable that we've come to know as the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? And guess what? The hero of the story isn't a Jewish priest or a Jewish scribe. It's a Samaritan. That's why everyone becomes enraged at that story. The other passage that was read for us in Luke 17 that Esther read for us is when Jesus heals 10 men from leprosy, and the remarkable part of the account is they all run off because they're excited they get their lives back, but then one of them turns around and remembers to come back and thank Jesus and wait for it. Not a Jew, but a Samaritan. In fact, at one point, when some of the religious leaders of the Jews want to insult Jesus, they say, aren't you a Samaritan? Jesus goes on to say, I honor my father and you dishonor me. They're trying to insult him, to disrespect him. And here's the thing that's really interesting. You might want to know this just for fun. Galilee shares the border with Samaria, right? And Nazareth, Nazareth, where Jesus comes from, it's the southernmost city in Galilee. So when you hear Nathaniel say, can anything good come from Nazareth? It's because being from Nazareth is almost as bad as being from Samaria. All right, now press the play button. So you get the point, right? If you are going to run from being persecuted, if you're going to run from being arrested, why? Oh, why would you run to Samaria? Why would you run to a town where the likelihood of your being rejected or antagonized or attacked is highly likely? Why would you do that? Now, let's look at those verses again, okay? Here's the thing I want you to realize. Obviously, Philip did not see U.S. Marshals because no one can accuse him of trying to keep a low profile here. Check out verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. It's elevation when we talk down. It's still going north. Uh, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. 
He does many signs and wonders. He tells people about Jesus. He casts out demons who evidently make a lot of noise. They shriek when they come out. And he heals people who are paralyzed and lame. Now, I've never been chased out of my home or out of a city before. But I think in Philip must think that he is bulletproof. I mean, he's just a sample of the whole lot, right? I remember verse four. I mean, they're all doing the same thing that Philip is doing, more or less. He is not even close to trying to keep a low profile. The things that got him in trouble in Jerusalem, he's just doing in a different town. And here's the other thing that's kind of interesting to me. When you think about what Luke says there that Philip is doing there in that Samaritan town, doesn't it sound a whole lot like the kind of stuff that Jesus was doing in the book of Luke? I mean, you know, healing, casting out demons, talking about the kingdom of God. And also, you know, and Scott was so kind to say that we've been in Acts for a few weeks. It's almost a year. Um, it also sounds a little bit like the stuff that the apostles have been doing in the book of Acts. The stuff we've been studying, right? The apostles, the original 11 plus the new, newly voted in one, they've been healing and casting out demons and talking about Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah, right? It also sounds kind of like some of the same stuff that Stephen was doing at the end of chapter six before he was arrested and killed. Now, this is an amazing book. Don't get me wrong. It really is an amazing book. But why does it seem like Luke is saying the same thing over and over again. It was about 30 years ago. Then I met Dr. Charles Rosell. And his name's not going to mean much to most of you, maybe uh, to all of you, I don't suspect. He pastored a place called First Baptist Church Leesburg in Leesburg, Florida. He was speaking in chapel about 30 years ago when I was in seminary, and I almost didn't go because I checked out who was speaking, and I didn't have a clue who the guy was, but I felt like the last thing I need is listen to another successful big church pastor tell me how it's done, you know, because it just kind of gets old after a while. But God, he, I remember this distinctly, God chastised me for my bad attitude. And so as a way to show contrition, I, I went to chapel that day. Now, Dr. Roselle started talking about how it was when he first came to Leesburg. You see, he had, he had uh, he'd been at a church in the area. In fact, he'd pastored a couple of churches and the church he was at had been doing fairly well when he was invited by these folks in Leesburg to have a talk with them. And they had told him they had about 150 people on the roll, which was a little less than the church he was at. But he said he, he felt like the Lord was prompting him. And so he and his wife, Edna Sue, they showed up to visit and preach in First Baptist Church Leesburg. And I remember Charlie saying the CIA couldn't find 35 people in the whole building, 150 people on the roll my eye. Now, the place was downtown. There were abandoned houses and buildings everywhere. White flight had been huge the whole bit. And the church was thinking it was time to move out of the area and move to the suburbs, right? And Charlie said he, when they first came, even before he, he, he agreed to go there, he said he just looked at the church facilities and he said, no way, Lord. And he said, and he heard the Lord say, Charlie, any old place will do if God is in the place. And so Charlie thought, okay, I guess I can't move him to the suburbs. 
Lord said, I want you to stay right here. And Charlie said, Lord, this is not the kind of place to grow a healthy church. To which he said, the Lord said, Charlie, any old place will do if God is in the place. So the Rosells, they accepted the call and they moved to First Baptist Church Leesburg. Charlie said they hadn't been there long when Charlie began reading Matthew 25, that last part, you know, Jesus talking about the sheep and the goats. You may be familiar with it. It's the part where Jesus talks about, you know, giving water to the thirsty and food to the hungry and clothes to those who have none and caring for the sick and visiting the imprisoned and that sort of thing. And Charlie said, God told him, you know, that could happen here. And Charlie said he was like, here? In this place? I, I know, Lord, I know any old place will do, but how am I supposed to start ministries like that here? I know nothing about that sort of thing. I don't have any. Join resources. the meeting. I don't have any help. I don't have a clue what I'm doing, he said. And then he got, he heard God say to him, Charlie, any old person will do if God is in the person. And so he didn't know what else to do. So he thought, all right, I can collect clothes. So they started a clothes closet. And that seemed to go pretty well. And so then they had a lot of space because the, most of the building was unused. And so they started a food pantry. And then he got a van and he started picking up kids from the community on Sunday mornings. And the next thing Charlie knows, the Lord says to him that he wants him to start an academy on Saturday mornings, teach literacy and math and Bible and make it fun and exciting and start sports and clubs, etc. And Charlie said, Lord, I don't know how to do any of that. I'm a preacher. They don't teach that in seminary. How am I supposed to do that? And Dr. Roselle said, and the Lord said to me, Charlie, any old person will do if God is in the person. Next thing you knew, there was a health clinic and an eye clinic and a mobile dental clinic. There was a job training center. Next thing you know, they'd bought up an entire city block of downtown Leesburg because nobody wanted it anyway. And God gave Charlie a vision for a place where no matter your need, there would be someone here to help you. Legal advice, marriage counseling, and on and on and on. When Dr. Charles Roselle retired, from First Baptist Church Leesburg. They baptized over 7,000 people in 29 years. But more importantly, they started 70 ministries to meet the needs of the surrounding community. I remember that. 30 years ago, I remember that sermon, his last two lines. Any old place will do if God is in the place. Any old person will do if God is in the person. Acts chapter eight, verse four says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. See, I realize that it would be an easy thing to read all that Jesus didn't say and say, I can't do that. I'm no Jesus. And maybe it would be an easy thing to read about the things the apostles did and say and say, I can't do that. I'm no apostle. 
And so Luke makes it a point of telling us that everyone scatters during the persecution except the apostles. They stay put. I reckon he figures we'll find it a bit harder to say, I can't do that. I'm no waiter of tables. And if we stay, say we still can't do what we're reading about now, don't worry about it because you just need to know that it's coming down the pike. You're going to get introduced to a eunuch, a Roman centurion, and a murderer. So that sooner or later, you and I, we wrap our heads around the truth of this book, which is it ain't about the place and it ain't much about the people. It's about the Holy Spirit in them. Any old place will do if God is in the place. And any old group of people will do if God is in the people. Would you pray with me? I thank you, God, for reminding me this week of what that fine man taught me all those years ago. I thank you, God, for teaching me this week to stop worrying about who I'm not and what I don't have. And so I simply pray for this beautiful, amazing congregation that you would fill them, you would fill us with your Holy Spirit in this place here in West Baltimore, that you will fill it with your Holy Spirit. Let us be part of seeing you work in amazing ways. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Amen.